So let me, all right, cool. I was about to say, let me know when you start. So uh, for those of you that don't know me, Brandon Miller, for those of you that do know me, I'm surprised you showed up. Um, but I always try to offer uh, any kind of safety courses for a handgun, well, any kind of gun safety. Um, I'm an NRA certified instructor. basic pistol for the uh, safety seminar which is what we're taking tonight and uh, the reason I do this is I'm a huge proponent of the Second Amendment I spent 20 years in the military right 11 times I raised my hand said I would support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America install enemies foreign and domestic but whenever I did that I could not exercise a lot of those same rights um, so I, I'm oh one is supporting, one is supporting. Yeah, the house. Uh, well, first of all, is there anyone that can't hear me? Uh, that's what I think. That's because you're old. Um, <laughs> you've probably shot way too much, so that's why your eardrums. Uh, but yeah, so the day that I got out of the military, I began fully exercising all of my rights. And this is just, the Second Amendment is just one of them, right? Uh, free speech. Uh, you don't have a right to free speech in the military. You don't have a right to peaceable assembly in the military uh, because you can, if where you're assembling is on the list, the ban list, or the people you're affiliated with is on the ban list, you don't have that right. Um, so there's a lot of different rights. So like I said, all the Bill of Rights, I'm, whenever you say, you know, what's your favorite? I don't have a favorite. I got 10 favorites. So it's, it's great. Um, so we'll actually go over, it's actually called the uh, the new shooter seminar uh, for NRA and it's a safety course and orientation course so there there won't be any range time uh, how many people are from West Virginia or live in West Virginia okay West Virginia just recently changed their laws right so you have open carry um, you have concealed carry are both considered constitutional carry now. So just as the fact that you're an adult, you can carry that. Um, age limits, I'm always shaky on. I know it's 21, right? But if you're 18 and you want to conceal, you can get a provisional license. I don't know how often 18-year-olds uh, get that. So 18 to 20, you can get provisional. Uh, 21 and above, it's a shall issue situation now. So unless you're a felon or you meet one of their, you know, I can't give it to you requirements, which I think there's only like four or five, um, then you pay your money, you get it. Uh, you don't need a license here unless you want to carry your firearm to other states. All the bordering states, except for Maryland, have reciprocity with West Virginia. So Maryland, do not take your firearm, even if you have a license into Maryland. Uh, they will keep you, they will keep your firearm. Um, other, other places are Massachusetts and New York City, or New York. Don't take your firearm. Um, what's that? Never, well, I've never been to Jersey, so I actually have once. I went to the airport. Um, so yeah, uh, this course will satisfy the requirement for your license, your uh Certified handgun license. Um, who didn't raise their hand? Who's not from West Virginia? Where are you from? Pennsylvania has constitutional carry, right? I don't, uh, well, yeah, you're right. They don't have constitutional carry, but they're a sh shall issue state. And I don't think there's a training requirement for Pennsylvania anymore. Um, so they used to, if I remember right, they used to have like their state certified course and they got rid of it. Um, where are you from? North Carolina. I don't know North Carolina, so I'm going to find out one of my favorite websites. Um, I used to do uh, concealedcarry.org. I like theirs. Uh, they had some issues with keeping up with some of the information sometimes. So now I point to this guns to carry, um, dot com, and uh, they seem to be more up on their law. So within whenever the bill for West Virginia was signed it was on their page that day whenever it went into action it was their page was changed that day so um, so North Carolina state gun laws uh, North Kakalaki that's southeast uh, what do we have what do we have uh, 
Oh, this is the other thing. I'm a visual person, so I love their website. So they, their their big items are: Can you carry in vehicles? Do you need special permission? Or, are there like Ohio has a lot of really weird uh, things. If you've had a drink in Ohio, your firearm has to be separate from you, and the ammunition has to be separate. So they will, you know, they'll if there's a caveat, they'll let you know. Uh, most notify officer, yes. What that means, Ohio, the same thing. Uh, North Carolina, the same thing. If you are carrying, the first words out of your mouth should be you holding up your license and you saying, I have a firearm in the vehicle. I, no, let me rephrase that. I have a license to carry a firearm. It's in my vehicle. And the officer should engage you and ask, where is it? Um, you can actually be arrested if you don't have that as the first thing. If you say, good morning, officer, and then they later on, you say that you have a firearm in the vehicle and you're licensed to carry it, they can actually arrest you. It's a misdemeanor, but they can arrest you. So it's one of the few, for Ohio, one of the few like misdemeanors that they actually take you downtown for. So everything else, they, they give you a, a, a summons or a, uh, or a ticket, and you take care of it on your own. I don't know. I can check uh, next. Um, constitutional carry, no. Open carry permitted, yes. Um, carry and liquor establishments, yes. So uh, that's actually kind of unusual. Most states have what they refer to commonly as the 51% rule. So if you if the uh, the the place that you're at if they get 51 percent of their profits from out the sale of alcohol, uh, then you're not allowed to carry there. Um, I always say the same thing. Once again, check here, but I carry everywhere. I do not take my firearm off of me unless it's at a police station or a, a court, or I know they have metal detectors. Uh, Concealed means concealed. So in Kentucky, I'm a huge proponent of open carry. I open carry at, at uh, uh, DerbyCon. I open carry everywhere but work because we have a rule against it. Um, unless I'm going into a place I know is off limits, then I conceal carry. And, and the reason is uh, there's one of these things. No weapon signs enforced. So in North Carolina, they have the power of law behind them stating that it's not just a trespassing. So what that tells me is there's some other law uh, on the books that said you that you can be cited for carrying a firearm. Uh, take uh, West Virginia and um, uh, Kentucky, if I remember right, West Virginia. But if I go into a premise that has a no firearm sign, and they say, you're carrying a firearm, you must leave. If I stay, I can be trespassed. That is it. So they can't do criminal trespass in the state of Kentucky. So I can't go to jail that day. I can be escorted off the premises. Now, we all have those friends that are, are part of the legal or the law enforcement uh, system. And they'll tell you that sometimes they will find a way to, to hit you with something else. Resisting arrest is always... Uh, common. Uh, so let me look at this real quick. Uh, is there a, uh, this is the reciprocity, how to apply. Usually it's written here. What I'm looking for is some, oh yeah, okay. So you have to take a class that's a minimum of eight hours. So this won't suffice for that, but stick around. Uh, West Virginia, you had a, you had a question about West Virginia? Yeah, about least I don't think it is uh, must notify officer no um, so what I what I always tell people is uh, judge it so the way that I carry if I open carry I'm sitting in my car I'll, whenever the cop pulls up you know walks up to my window I'll just say I'll have my hands on the steering wheel and I'll say hey I don't know if you notice, but I do have a firearm on me and it's on my right hip and almost every time they've said you don't touch yours, and I won't touch mine. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, you play along, like a little, you know, a little giddy school girl. Oh, yeah, that's funny. I've heard that. Um, if, I'm, if I'm concealed carrying in one of these uh, states where it's not required, I don't tell them. And the reason is, is after concealed carrying for so long, what I've really figured out is nobody knows you're carrying. So how many people conceal carry? 
it's it's a weird feeling even though I've done it for so long. One of the telltale, the only way that people know that I'm concealed carrying is every once in a while because if I don't wear a gun belt, my, my belt sags and I'll lift up like that. So if you're another carrier, you see that and you know. If you're not, it's another fat guy adjusting his belt, right? That's what we do. Um, but it, it's, it's one of those things where, uh, Coleon Noir, anybody know who he is? That's like one of my favorite NRA guys, right? Uh, black guy, lawyer from Houston, great. Um, he'll tell you all the time, like almost every video he has, he'll say, stop touching your dang gun, because you don't need to, right? Uh, so that answers your question, right? So, yeah. On the subject of notifying, yeah. Yeah. Told the cop immediately, and the cop said, "Why are you telling me?" Yeah. You don't have to, and he said, "Well, you know, figure you have a tough job. You know, I respect you, that sort of thing." Yeah. Right. He got a warning. Yeah. And then have lunch with the cop. So. Yeah, I mean, every officer is going to be slightly different. Um, I've actually been in Louisville, downtown Louisville, whenever the DerbyCon was in the Hyatt. I was across the street at Potbelly's. And it's funny because I go walking in and people that are there to eat for the conference, you know, they're at the conference. They like, they look over and they part like the seas and there's a cop standing there. So I just walk up. I mean, I cut to the front of the line because everybody just got out of line. So I step up there and he goes, hey, what you carrying? And I was like, well, this is actually my wife's Glock. I said, I normally don't carry a Glock, but mine's at my uh, my gunsmith right now getting a new trigger. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I replaced the trigger on mine too. And so everybody's just like, oh, okay, it's not weird. And then they go back to getting in line. So it, every encounter is going to be slightly different. Uh, I am not a lawyer. Um, whenever I talk to my brother who brother-in-law who is a lawyer about this, he'll say the same thing. Uh, he always tells people, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. So I'm not going to tell you how to handle that situation. Now, if you want, if you get in a bind and you want to pay me, I'll give you a lot of advice. But he's like, beforehand, until that phone rings, I'm not your lawyer. I'm like, All right. I'm like, but I have, I have your sister. And he's like, yeah, I know. I'm not your lawyer. Not for this topic. All right. So any other questions? Like I said, I, I love this website. Um, they always have the disclaimer at the bottom that says, don't trust us, look it up for yourself, uh, which I do recommend. Uh, the other thing that I like is their reciprocity um, map. So once again, Maryland's always going to be red. They recognize no one. New York recognizes no one. California recognizes no one. Um, but all the blue states is everybody that will recognize your concealed handgun license. You can't conceal in Kentucky and if you get stopped they say what are you doing? Well I have constitutional carry back home. Eh, it doesn't matter. You're not back home. What's that? Yes. So yeah, so the issuing state on their maps is always going to be the green state. And then all the blue is 100%. Um, uh, yellow is what they call carry allowed. So like, uh, one of those is what, I don't know, that yellow Vermont, Maine, right? The free states, uh, they'll say things like, oh, you got a license? Cool. And we don't require our people to do that because we're, you know, we believe in liberty. Um, so, and then red, permit not honored. And then some of them, uh, Hawaii, oh, Hawaii used to be white. Okay, so now they just, they, they don't honor them. It used to be they don't even recognize that you, you're allowed to have a firearm. So, it was actually, I turned 21 shortly, uh, shortly before arriving in Hawaii. So the very first gun I bought was Connecticut. So I had like an eight round capacity magazine, is all I could have. And then whenever I got to Hawaii, I felt special because I could upgrade to a 10-round magazine. So it was great. All right, so the actual seminar itself. Like I said, unless you've never seen or touched a gun, 
uh, probably none of this is going to be new to you. But there's a lot of things I like to reinforce. Um, and if you want to get a permit uh, for the West Virginia people in here, nobody was from Virginia, right? Okay, everybody's, okay, that's for dinner. Sorry, sorry, can't help you. Um, but uh, if you want to get a permit, what we can do is I've got a, a friend that works for a law firm, and uh, I can get a notarized, um, not an affidavit, yeah, affidavit, right? Uh, affidavit that's got uh, my credentials on it and saying that you took a uh, NRA class and that uh, you can take that up to the sheriff's department and pay your fee and do your background check. Do they fingerprint here? No. I think, okay. Is it? Oh, I have no idea. Uh, if you go back to that web, well, if you can't go back to that website, but if I go back to that website for you. Yeah. Yeah, you got like your state fee, you got your, your local corruption fee, you got your license fee. What? Yes, exactly. I, I, oh my God! Sheriff's Department, everybody. I know. And what's cool about the Sheriff's Department here? Why they raise their fees up so much? Because that's unbudgeted money for the Sheriff's Department. In other words, oh. they get to keep the money. Huh? So, like in Kanawha County, we uh, we collected so much money on pistol permits that they bought vests for everybody. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I can support the, that. This, but this but two hundred bucks is still it's play money. For the sheriff. I mean, yeah. that's, the county commission doesn't control it. Yeah. See, in Kentucky, I, I think Pennsylvania is very similar because they're both commonwealths, right? Pennsylvania is a commonwealth. Uh, what they'll do a lot of times is in their law, they will allocate what portion of that money goes where. So the state or the commonwealth itself will say, we can charge this amount of money, and here's how it gets apportioned. And that's that's how it shall be divided. Um, Massachusetts, being the commonwealth, is the one outlier. They, they don't typically write their laws that way, from what I understand. All right, so back to this. So what we're going to cover is... Um, once again, this is a NRA course, so what you will have for every NRA course you, you take, everyone, doesn't matter what it is, even if you have, uh, NRA teaches some courses that aren't gun, re, or they're not gun courses, so they're safety courses, it's called uh, like defense in your home or something like that, um, where they'll talk about how to uh, bars on your windows, bars on your doors, uh, certain type of plants that you plant or on the outside. Uh, firearms are only one portion of that whole class. It's like a very small portion. Um, you'll still get the the gun safety speech, the the three rules of, of firearms. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about storage, uh, types of firearms and their parts, um, magazines, ammunition. Uh, the number one rule for ammunition is don't shoot it in your firearm if it's not stamped on your firearm. Okay? You should hear, I, I teach these classes a lot, and the things that I hear scare me sometimes. Uh, the, the conversation I've had between 223 and 556, every class is shocking. They are not the same round. You can shoot a 223 and a 556. You can not safely shoot a 556 and a 223. What I say by that is the rounds look almost identical. The nose or the, the throat on one, the 5.56 five, is different. The tolerance is different, but the gas, much different. Much higher gas compression rate for 5.56. Five, I could actually see it blowing a 2.23 barrel. Um, and then I'm always a proponent. Shoot a 38 and a 357. Yes. And people do it all the time. I've done it. Why? 357 is freaking expensive. 38 is almost like 22, right? Um, but you can usually find 38. I guess 22 is coming back where you can find it anywhere now. Um, if it's not stamped, don't shoot it. That, that's always my rule. Uh, we'll talk about sight pictures or different types of sights, what to expect at the range, what you need at the range. Uh, cleaning your gun, I don't go in depth. 
and the reason is every gun's different. Um, one of my favorite of my, I never say how many guns I have, but of my top five favorite guns, they're all 22 caliber. Um, the only 22 caliber that does not make it on that list is the Ruger 22 Mark III. And the reason is, is when you're cleaning it, if you read the manual, it says flip it upside down, turn it away from you, and then remove this pin. And the reason is, is there's this little dangly pin, and if you don't turn it upside down at a 45 degree angle, that dangly pin will fall the other way, and you gotta buy a special tool to get it back. So, what's that? Well, yeah, there's other ways to fix it, but I'm cheap. I've gotten, of all the firearms I have, I've only ever replaced one part. See, every you can use a screwdriver, but every time I try to use it, I always screw up my screwdriver because you got to get a little. Uh, so I went out and bought a Mark IV because it didn't have that thing. Oh. Uh, but so we're not going to talk specific cleaning. We're just uh, hit cleaning and then some other uh, NRA training course information. Um, so the purpose of this is to give you the basics, the, the knowledge, the skills, and the attitude. Uh, I always focus on attitude, and the reason is, is usually at this level course, half the crowd is scared of guns, and this is their first foray into guns. And, and what I always say, and what it even says later on, is... A gun is not good or bad. It's a tool. You are the person that uses the tool. So it's your your fault. Um, so you have to have the right attitude when dealing with firearms. Uh, I'll have people all the time say, what gun should I buy for my first gun? You know, I want to start carrying. And my first question is always this. Can you take somebody else's life in defense of your own? You hesitated? I don't recommend you buy a gun. Because if you hesitate whenever you're carrying a gun, it can be used against you. There are other methods, other tools you can use. So that's one of those soul-searching things I always tell people to do before you buy your first gun. And whenever you get to the point that you no longer hesitate, then I think you have the right attitude. Uh, gun safety, here's the three rules you'll get in every NRA class. Um, always keep it pointed downrange if you're military. We always say downrange, but in a safe direction. Okay, so always point it in a safe direction. Um, ground is preferable over sky, right? Uh, I still have people that will walk around with a handgun like this. I'm like, please don't do that because you don't know where it's coming. It, it goes out this end and it comes back down because of the earth gravity. Um, number two, keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to use it. And this, this is one of the hardest things, even for like law enforcement officers who've been carrying firearms for years. There's this natural, inane, trigger touching sense that we have whenever you pull out a firearm. And you have to be able to train that out of your system. Because you just naturally, we've got this opposable thumb thing. Uh, whenever you grab a firearm, you want to grab it, right? You want to hold it and take control of it. And you're doing that. And there's a trigger between you and that finger, right? So it really takes some practice and repetition to keep that finger pointed. Um, at one point, there was this uh, method, what broke me, uh, there was this really horrible method in shooting called the point-and-shoot method. And the basis of it was was great. So you have a natural, uh, a dominant eye. My, my dominant eye is my right eye, right? When I have my dominant hand is my right hand. So naturally, wherever I point, that's where my dominant eye lines up. It's just how it works. I mean, it's just one of those things. So the concept is, I have a firearm. Whenever I have my finger down the slide of that firearm, it's called the point and shoot method. Whatever I'm pointing at is what I'm going to shoot. Um, that part of the, the training exercise is good. The rest of it is all trash. Uh, and then the third one is uh, uh, keep it unloaded until you're ready to use it. Uh, obviously, if you're doing concealed carry, it's going to be loaded. Um, we don't talk about what's called ready conditions or ready states, one through five. Um, so that, that would be like uh, a zero is you've got no ammunition in the gun. 
and then all the way up to five is there's ammunition and gun, there's a round in the chamber, the hammer is cocked back if it's a, a, a double action or single double. Um, so those kinds of things. Uh, if you're at the range, there's no reason for you to go to a range with ammunition in your gun. Uh, most ranges will actually uh, ask you to leave. Um, at least the the couple of times that I screwed up and did it, right? Um, I've been asked to leave. Yeah. When you go into a gun shop, don't pull out your gun. And pull yeah. Out the counter and go, I need have it loaded. They said, yeah. oh, it's unloaded. They said, I've got a whole jar full of unloaded ammunition that people thought that their gun was unloaded and threw up on the counter. When Cabela's first opened in Lexington, they had a sign that said, um, uh, safety check station. Please check all of your firearms with one of our people here. Problem was, is everybody was walking up. So if you were holstered, you would go there. That, that's not what it was intended to do. So they would take an, a loaded firearm, give it to the person, make it clear right there in front of the or in the front of the store. Uh, so they actually changed the sign, and it said, "For re our return policy is that the firearm must be unloaded, and you bring it to the safety check station." Yeah. Oh yeah. Really? Okay. Well, ours doesn't do that anymore. Um, so, other things to know. Uh, know wh what your target is, and more importantly, what's beyond that target. Uh, this is one of the biggest rules for hunters. Hunter education. They, they, there's like a whole hour-long lesson on this. Shoot, don't shoot. Um, and, and it's things of uh, understand that a, f a bullet does not stop where you intend it to stop. Uh, most gun battles, they say, are within about 10, 10 to 15 feet. That doesn't mean your bullet's going to stop at 16 feet, right? Uh, some of these, uh, 17 HMR, 17 HR, HMR, that's a varmint rifle. A uh, little bit smaller than a 22, but uh, more powder, more compression, I should say. Um, that thing has a flat trajectory, and it will go for a mile before it stops. Same thing with the 22. It's a little bit more of an arc, but... Um, yeah, so know what's beyond your target. Um, know how to use the gun safely. Uh, two things I always tell people to read about is a new car and a new gun. Uh, because they all operate differently. Um, I actually found that one of my Glocks... I used to have a hard time breaking down a Glock to clean it until I read the manual one time and I realized I was pushing the slide way too far back and it was actually jamming whenever I was trying to get the stinking pin out. So once it said slight, or slightly depress the slide with the thumb, that pin comes right out. It almost falls out. It's great. Uh, let's see. Uh, be sure the uh, gun is safe to operate. You'd be surprised how many times we have range time and people show up with uh, you know, a gun that's been sitting outside in the rain and it was manufactured in 1945, right? It's a model 1911 pistol that they haven't seen for 60 years and they want to test it on your shooting range. Don't, don't do that. Uh, use only the correct ammunition for your gun. We already covered that. Wear eye and ear protection as appropriate. Um, I actually, if there's anything I splurge on, it's eye and ear protection. I've shot some cheap guns before, but I always made sure I've had good eye and ear protection. Um, never use alcohol or drugs before or while shooting. That is a NRA rule. Um, I can tell you that some states, uh, like I said, it's up to the officer to determine if you're drunk um, or that you're impaired. Um, but I always say don't use drugs or alcohol. Uh, be aware of certain types of guns and uh, mini shoot. Whoa! Be aware that certain types of guns and mini shooting activities. Oh, I didn't see the second line. Activities require additional safety precaution. Uh, in Kentucky, we have a range where they will do uh, once a year for like a week. They'll like suspend cars and they'll have like Barrett 50 cows. They'll have fully auto like. Uh, 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 chain guns, and you can go out there and get range time and shoot. 
So if you can pay for the ammo and you can pay for the range time, you can shoot it. Uh, just be aware that if you're using a bolt action single shot Cricket 22 and you're using a Barrett 50 cal sniper rifle, they're going to operate different and they're going to have different uh, different levels of knowledge and understanding, right? Casings are hot. Casings are hot. <laughs> yeah. I still, to this day, I had one opportunity to shoot for the uh, for the Navy, and um, I missed shooting the expert class um, by two points. So all I would have had to do was hit the target. But my very first shot, it was a two-person range, and I'm waiting for the guy, and waiting for the guy and waiting for the guy. And apparently he was waiting for me. So I leaned into it and right before I pulled the trigger, he shot and the casing hit me in the neck and I shot about five feet downrange. Cause I went like that. So yeah, still angers me to this day. Um, understand that even though uh, we live under uh, the Constitution, the Second Amendment, um, there are certain responsibilities that come with gun ownership and gun usage. I will never tell you, unless you're being unsafe, uh, how to use your gun, how much training you should have, uh, things of that nature. Um, but just understand that there is a certain level of responsibility for using that firearm. Uh, home safety stores, so uh, do we have any questions so far? I mean, you guys are doing good asking questions as we go. All right, cool. So some of the safety and storage, uh, we are at a hacker conference. Uh, I will tell you that other than vaults, use all of these at your own peril, right? Um, I've seen very expensive gun safes. Uh, here they call them strong, bo strong boxes and metal gun safes. You can drop them on their edge and they'll open up like a clam. A steam clam. Uh, I've seen some very expensive ones. You can literally stick, uh, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, Deviant Olam uh, actually has some videos of him testing some of these things. It would be like a $200 gun safe or, or uh, a metal box, and he'll defeat it with like a, a wrapper for a piece of gum. Right? I mean, it's just. Be aware of what you're buying. There are websites that will actually go out and test these and make some. They won't recommend safes, but there's definitely ones that they will tell you not to buy. Uh, trigger and cable locks. I think, I don't know if it's law. I think it's law. Now you have to have one. Yes. So Jeff Puppio did a few talks at Jimmy Con about, I think, with safes and gun safes, mm -hmm. and basically defeated a whole shit. Whole bunch of them. Yeah. And yeah. I think you want to see how some trigger locks are to uh, uh, even gray or pet. You got some open lock pick. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The the actual, like the ones that come with uh, guns now, you have the cable locks, right? Those are pretty easy to pick. But even easier, uh, in my opinion, I mean, are, are the two disc style that they actually they have a post and then a receptacle, and you put the two discs together. Those, a lot of them, you can actually shove something in there and pull the trigger because it doesn't fully cover the, the guard. Uh, that, yeah. And yank hard. Oh, squeeze. oh, squeeze. Okay. Yeah. I know in my town, yep. West Virginia, mm -hmm. there's sometimes, uh, sometimes here you go to the police station, they'll give them these for free. Oh, yeah. And, and here's the deal about these. So the purpose for these is really to slow you down. So, you know, if you have a gun lock on your gun, it's so that you can't use your gun. Right? So. It, I mean, what I feel uh, comfortable with both of those locks um, with my 12-year-old, yeah. My 18-year-old, no, because she's already at Circle City Con defeated two of the three locks I have in my house. Uh, plastic and fabric gun cases. Um, biggest thing I have to say about these is the fabric ones, if you want to fly with your gun, uh, there's no airline that will accept those as a, as a gun, a lockable gun safe. Um, but the plastic ones, they will if they can't get. Some airlines actually have a device where they'll pull it and see if they can shove that device in there. If they can, it's unacceptable. Uh, and everywhere there is a lock hole, you have to have a lock on. So if you buy a gun case with one lock hole, you have to have one lock. Uh, one of my rifle cases has like six holes, and I gotta have a lock for every one of them. 
Uh, no. no. It can't be. Yeah, as a matter of fact, there is one thing that you can put, one type of lock you can put on a gun lock. It's a non-TSA approved uh, lock. So what will happen is TSA will take control, or well, the airline will take control of your box. Uh, they will mark it for TSA. TSA will scan it. If TSA needs to see the inside of it, they'll come get you. Uh, Deviant has a, a on his website. I don't know if it's still there. I've used it for years. It's actually called. Uh, he did a DefCon presentation called "Packing the Friendly Skies," and he has like words of advice. And one of them is show up early and stick around until the agent releases you, so that way you know that the TSA agent has actually scanned it. So no one is allowed to have access to your firearm without your permission, and you have to be in. You have to be there to do it yourself. They're not allowed to open up your cases. So, even if, even if you make the declaration and you say my gun is unloaded, and whenever they scan it, they see it's loaded, they're not allowed to take action. Oh, I think there's a lot of other things. Sorry, there's a lot of other things they can do. Um, but you're the one that has to provide the lock. Now they may have a like a police officer there, and as soon as you provide the key, they cuff you for your protection. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard those stories before. Um, that is not an NRA endorsed story, but um, strong boxes and metal gun cases. Like I said, you, you for most things, I would say you get what you pay for, but this isn't really true. Um, there's biometric locks that can be expensive that you can defeat with the gum wrapper. There's very cheap metal boxes that are very difficult to to. To defeat, so just uh, just do some research on them. Uh, locking steel gun cabinets; these are usually uh, larger uh, steel cabinets that aren't really considered safes or vaults. Um, and then you have the ultimate, penultimate uh, gun safes. Um, I've never really seen a safe that I didn't like. Um, usually. Uh, what I don't like about them is the fire rating. So gun safes are rated by how long they can take a heat of a certain temperature, uh, and that's how they rate the safe. So if it's like a 24-hour gun safe, um, you're going to be paying thousands of dollars for that uh, because they just, you know, 1,000 degrees over 24 hours, that's actually pretty impressive. Yeah, they're not cheap. Um, uh, so some of the types of guns, there's basically two types. Uh, NSA, or NSA, NRA classifies uh, long guns and pistols. All right. So your long guns, you're going to have different actions. So actions is literally the mechanism or the action involved in firing the, the gun. Uh, bolt action is pretty common. That's actually where you've seen in like the old World War I movies where they crank it over, pull it back, crank it back forward, and slam it down. Uh, lever action, that's going to be your old cowboy gun, right? Bam, 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 bam. Uh, pump action, uh, one of the, yeah, my, my father-in-law likes to say, you can go in the middle of Africa where they've never seen a firearm before, and whenever you rack that pump action shotgun, they're going to take notice. It's like the universal sound for danger, right? Uh, Semi-automatic action. Uh, these are all those scary guns, um, the ones that you know, everybody's trying to outlaw. Uh, basically, what it means is you pull the trigger once, it fires one bullet. But as fast as you can pull the trigger, it will fire that many bullets. Does that make it fully semi-automatic? <laughs> yeah, it's fully semi-automatic, yes. <laughs> Yeah, now a bump stock is still considered semi-automatic because the bump mechanism is different from the action group. So, uh, hinge action, these are some of your older shotguns. Um, and then uh, falling block action, this is pretty cool. So it's usually a lever action, and what it is is it actually has a, a blocking device in there that will grab the round and, and move it. So I've actually, the only one I've ever seen of those is at the NRA Museum. So that's pretty cool. Uh, typical parts. So you will have, in order to have a rifle, you have to have a shot, uh, stock. Now that stock can be short, but you have to have a stock. All right. Uh, bolt handle, for, if you have a bolt action. Um, a safety, not all firearms have a safety. 
Uh, once again, understand your 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 gun. Uh, trigger guards uh, that goes around the trigger. It's supposed to keep it from accidentally discharging. Um, some firearms, my AR-15 that I'm building, actually has a removable trigger guard. So if you if you know I get cold, I'm from Texas, it's freezing up here. Um, if I'm wearing big gloves, I can't get my finger inside the trigger guard. So I'm having that removable. Uh, the trigger, that's actually what you pull in order to fire the, the gun. Uh, the barrel and the muzzle. Uh, most people forget about the muzzle. That's where the, the that's the very end, that's where the bullet comes out. Uh, for shotgun, very similar. You have the stock, the safety, trigger guard, trigger, barrel, muzzle. And then on some models, you'll have a hinge release. And what that will do is that will actually, that break action one, or the, the I forget what the NRA calls it, the hinge action. Uh, I grew up calling it a break action. Uh, that would be the release so that that will break out. Uh, you, how many people have never shot a break action shotgun? Okay, when you flip that switch, make sure you're not looking at it. Because depending on the manufacturer, you can have some, some force whenever, because whenever you break it, usually it's spring loaded and you'll, you'll have assisted ejection. So some you have to pull out with your fingers, but some of them will hit you right in the eye and it hurts. All right, so questions about rifles? I mean, that, that's really like the, the basics of, of rifles or shotguns. So I had a friend yeah. shoot. We had a, a gun shoot. Mm -hmm. And we're trying each other's out. God bless America. We're, yeah. We're trying to, a buddy of mine had a, uh, somebody gave him a shotgun. He shoots it once. Yep. Turns around and it goes off. It was one of the ones where as, as many times as you pull the trigger. Oh, semi? Okay. And, and, and of course, nobody told him this. Yeah. So it's yeah. another thing. Don't think just shotguns is just one shot. Yeah, and no. So, yeah, one of the things I don't talk about there, and Adrian and I had this conversation before, is you can have semi auto shotguns as well. Um, so as many times you pull the trigger, it can go. You can also have some shotguns that have two triggers. If it's a double barrel break action, it may have two triggers. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's. I, well, I don't know why. More rugged. I don't know. Tradition. Probably. Probably. Uh, types of pistols, so we'll talk about single action revolvers, double action revolvers, and semi-auto pistols. Uh, the thing I always like to tell people, because I probably shot and carried guns for 30 years before I understood the difference. So single action literally means when you pull the trigger, a single action occurs. That means the hammer slams forward. All right. So what you have to do on a single action or an old cowboy gun, remember in the movies, they're like, bam, they're fanning it. Bam, bam, bam. So what they're doing is they're pulling it back, pulling the hammer back, and then pulling the trigger. And what that does is the trigger basically moves a mechanism out of the way so that the hammer can fall forward. That's the single action. A double action will be when you pull the trigger, it pulls the hammer back to a certain point and then slams the hammer forward. So that's the difference between a single action and a double action. Some guns are both. Semi-autos can be single, double, or uh, single, double. A lot of revolvers so. are also... Yeah, double yeah. actions you can't choose to... Yes, to pull it back. Which um, makes it really sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, and the other thing to, to understand is for a, uh, uh, for like a single double, um, when you pull the hammer back, so I have, I have a firearm that has a five pound trigger. It's a semi auto with a five pound trigger. That's a lot for a semi auto. Whenever you pull that hammer back, it now becomes like a two pound trigger. So you only have to do this and you're firing it. Right. So whenever that first shot that that where I'm doing the double action, I have to I have to I mean pull on that trigger. But then after that, the hammer's back because the slide goes back whenever it expel or expels the the casing and it pulls that hammer back for me. Yes, Adrian. When you put into the range, definitely be careful with them because uh, I had a buddy of mine pick my uh, uh, pipe bomb and uh, he. Back the hammer, had his finger on the trigger, was right, walking up to the firing line with his yeah. on the trigger, and he ended up almost shooting his foot. What's rule number two? Point in the safe direction at all times. One, one, that's one. Two is don't put your finger on the trigger until, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 
uh, semi-auto pistol uh, parts. So once again, we have the muzzle. Every gun has a muzzle. Um, you have the barrel. Uh, this doesn't do a good job because the barrel is actually inside. The, where, the, where the barrel, the red line is touching, it's actually the slide, but they, they didn't show that. Uh, the slide is that whole upper mechanism that, that comes back and it literally slides back. Um, you have a slide stop on semi-autos. That's usually how you uh, check it safe or it will go in the, the uh, slide back. Uh, whenever you hit the last bullet, whenever you shoot the last bullet, not every gun is this way, but most semi-autos that I've shot are this way. Whenever you fire the last bullet, it locks open because that slide lock actually pops up, and whenever that last action comes back, it stops. I've actually had one LCP. Somebody talked about the Ruger LCP earlier. I had that gun for probably just a couple of months because it didn't have a slide lock on the last shot. So I was always pulling the trigger one more time, and I didn't want that. Uh, you have the trigger again. You have a, a, a frame, some type of frame, a trigger guard, and then the magazine. Probably one of the one of the things that I just irks me. Um, it is not a clip. So a clip is usually a flat device like this that you will see the bullets clipped onto. Um, some of your old firearms like uh, uh, M1 Garand, uh, they have clips. So whenever you pull it out of the box, the ammo is sitting on this retaining clip. And you actually stick it into the firearm and you push the bullets in. And the clip, usually whenever you hit that last shot, you hear a bing because it shoots that clip out. Magazine, completely different. Block clips, yeah. Actually, yep. yep. Are yeah. They, so. The out, the yeah, the clip is is there. It, it just comes out in your hand. Yeah. So there's two types of M1s. You have the M1, which is the 30 caliber, and the M1 Garand, which is a grand. Some people will say. So they actually have different. M1 carbines, 30, 30 or 38. I always forget. Yeah. Um, all right, and then for the, uh, for the, um, I was about to call it a wheel gun, uh, <laughs> for the revolvers, that's, uh, that's what my father-in-law calls them, uh, you'll have different, you'll have the muzzle, every gun has a muzzle, you have a barrel, you can actually see the barrel there, uh, the ejector rod, that is to actually eject the shell casing whenever you open up the, well, you have the frame in that little carriage in the middle is known as the cylinder. So you'll have your bullet casings in there. Um, whenever you shoot a bullet, the casing stays behind and it actually enlarges slightly. So what that is, that ejector rod, it's basically like a plunger. So you'll have some, you can turn it up and some will just fall out and some may not. You have to push a button, slide that plunger down, ejector rod. A cylinder release latch, that's to open it up. Uh, grip, uh, trigger guard. So are there any questions about pistols? Pretty much all the same. Um, you have what's called a J-frame and, and then semi-autos. Um, yeah. uh, magazine storage device designed to hold cartridges. So that's the official term for the whole, what most people call a bullet. The bullet's only the lead piece at the top, right? And then you have the cartridge. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the casing, and then inside the casing you have a primer at the bottom. That's what you're striking to cause a instantaneous little fire that ignites the, the uh, powder that's inside. Um, you have box magazines and tubular magazines. Box are what's going to be right there in that picture. It's considered a box magazine. And then a tubular magazine, uh, whenever I was a kid and I had a little 22 rifle, uh, you had that long tube that ran along the barrel and you would put the bullets in that way. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, am ammunition, like I said, the biggest thing here is make sure your ammunition is in good order. Um, I'm the kind of person, because I travel with my guns a lot, I will load and unload them, um, flying specifically. 
if it gets to the point where I've got too much uh, fingerprints on my gun casings, I'll go ahead and take those to the range, shoot them, and get new ones. Because for me, that's kind of an indicator as to how old the bullet is, how many times I've handled it, right? So I always say, once again, not an official NRA thing, but I always say you want to shoot your ammo every year. Uh, you don't want to keep ammo for, for long periods of time. It won't hurt as long as you keep it, uh, you know, in a dry uh, area, but just... I'm a big proponent of refreshing your ammo. If you're, yeah, you have 22 that's older than you. Yeah. Oh, I shoot it. Oh, okay. So you're talking actual disposal. I'm talking about throwing that lead down range to get rid of it. Actual disposal. Um, talk to shotgun shells. You can cut. You can just cut them bad boys open. Um, yeah. So what I do, I tell people take them to your take them to your your gun range, and um, a lot of times they'll dispose of them for you. Um, sometimes they'll shoot it for you, and I'm like, hey, once I give it to you, I don't care what you do with it. Um, you're willing to shoot it, I'm not. Shotgun shells expanding, that tells me it's going to have an issue in the barrel. Oh, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't just leave it there. Talk to your local gun shops. See what they recommend. Uh, one thing you don't do is take it to your... Well, I don't recommend taking it to your local fire department. I did that one time, and it caused a lot of paperwork. They, they accepted it willingly. But, yeah, they, they made me fill out hazmat paperwork. They made me fill out all kinds of stuff. But I mean, I was in, it was when I was in Hawaii, I had no option. I wouldn't even just throw it in the trash. Um, uh, caliber. Match the caliber. The box with the barrel stamp. Uh, sights. So almost every gun comes with iron sights. That's going to be your front post and your rear post. And I always talk about, I always say read the manual as to your how you get your sight picture. Um, because some will do what's called lollipopping. So you have your front sight, your rear sight, those would be level and equal spacing. And what you do is you put your, you put it on the bottom of whatever the target is. So it looks like a lollipop. Um, some guns, uh, it's what I call cover up. So you have your front and your back sight, and you actually cover up the picture. So you need to read your manufacturer's handbook to see what type of sight picture your firearm has. Uh, and then optical sights. I'm not a big proponent of optical sights just because I'm cheap. Uh, but I've got a friend that shoots competitively, and there's no way he could do it without his optical sights. Uh, any questions about sights? All right, what to expect at the range? Uh, you will always have, well, I, I never say always. You should have, at any reputable range, a range safety officer. That is someone that, who's solely responsible for everything that happens on that range. Um, they will use range commands. Uh, the most common ones are going to be cease fire, range is hot, cease fire meaning stop firing. Don't fire that one last bullet because you know it's in there. You've been counting as you're shooting. When they say cease fire, you stop. You make your, uh, they may say uh, make weapons uh, clear or show action clear. It depends on your range. Uh, if it's an NRA certified range with NRA certified range safety officers, they are supposed to have the same uh, vernacular across all ranges. Uh, commence firing. Some ranges will say the range is hot meaning don't move beyond the line, uh, and then they will say commence firing. Uh, so it really depends. I, I, I don't know of a range other than the state range uh, that didn't have, that doesn't have a range safety officer. Right, You just go there, it's on your own. Um, I've never had a range that didn't require a safety briefing of some type where they go over the commands. Uh, once again, if they say cease fire, stop shooting immediately, finger off the trigger, wait for further instructions. Um, all right. 
Uh, what you'll need at the range, you don't really need anything other than a gun and bullets. But it's really helpful if you have a gun case, a good sturdy gun case. Uh, I use gym bags sometimes. I don't recommend that uh, just because you get a lot of weight in there. And I've destroyed many NRA gym bags because they're cheap. And you, you, I've actually had, uh, one time I had like 150 pounds of ammo. And uh, it just didn't, it, it fell through the bottom. It, uh, ear protection, you should always have ear protection. That is one of those things where you usually get what you pay for. Um, so I, I always say, you know, good ear protection. Those little foamies that you can buy, those typically are good for about 60 decibels. Uh, a lot of your firearms are going to be running at 80, 90 higher. Um, so I always caution people whenever they show up with those little foamies, they stick them in their ears. So I'll usually make, make them put on like Mickey Mouse plugs, um, so the, the over the ear plugs. So I'll make them do dual protection. Uh, mine actually, uh, you use the sound. They have, uh, uh, little microphones in them. And whenever they hear that sonic clap, then they'll actually close. I've actually had some issues with those my son he's 12 uh, for his 10th birthday he asked if he could buy a um a ruger bearcat uh, uh cowboy style gun right and um i knew it might still have a little bit of a kick um so we got some subsonic rounds um so they had less powder don't don't go as fast not as much kick and my earphones wouldn't register it was right below the register so my ears are bleeding by the end of the day so they wouldn't automatically close don't recommend that um, eye protection you should always have good eye protection uh, I usually tell people go with an ANSI rated eye protection if it's good enough for somebody that's working in a factory it's probably good enough for, for somebody that's shooting a firearm Ammunition desired for your firearm, and then, of course, targets. Some ranges will provide targets. Some ranges you have to use their targets. Always bring your own just in case. Uh, cleaning your gun. Like I said, I'm not going to go too in-depth on this because every gun you clean differently. The difference between a Ruger Mark III and a Ruger Mark IV is one generation, but you clean them differently because they break down differently. Um, just make sure that... You're not using too much oil. If you use oil a lot, that's okay. Make sure you wipe off all the excess. You'd be surprised how many people I've seen have jams and it's oil related because they'll just, oh, oil's good, right? Eh. Well, these things are designed for very minimal tolerances. So if you get too much oil in a barrel, you could have, uh, it could lead to like stove piping, it could lead to, uh, uh, Improper ejections, basically. Um, and then uh, something else is you can overclean guns, especially if you're using astringent cleaners. Uh, use use cleaners that are specific for guns uh, because they'll get all the grime off without like ripping off your 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 gun bluing and and all of that, right? A lot of different kits available. Uh, it really depends on your liking. I use a product now called, uh, it's not Frog Spit. It's Frog something, I can't remember. But um, it's cool because I usually have to clean my firearms about every fifth or sixth trip to the range. Because that would be the first time I see powder. So I, I'll have to look this up. Um, frog Lube. Thank you. So frog loop, whenever you put that on there, it will actually, powder will not stick to metal. I love that stuff. So about every fifth time I'll run a, a ramrod, or I actually use snakes. I'll pull a snake through it, and um, it's great because there'll be like just a little tiny bit of powder, and that'd be it. Frog loop. Yeah. They, they are a bit dirty. Yeah, this is so this is the last slide. It's um 
go to nrainstructors.org. Um, every NRA training class is on there, and you can look for your area or whatever area you want to train in. Uh, my father-in-law, brother-in-law, and I went to, uh, well, our, our whole family went down to Orlando, and they took a gun class down there, uh, one of the advanced courses. Um, but yeah, so there is a program, uh, if this was a paid-for course, uh, there would be a little packet I would give to you. And one of the things that, that's in there is the CMP, the Civilian Marksmanship Program. And this is really cool because it gets people shooting. Uh, you can actually turn in your, your scores and you can get badges and so on, uh, badges and stuff like that. Um, but it's cool because if you become a member, you have access to military surplus firearms. So they will literally, there's, uh, there's sites all over the country that the military has gun store, right? Uh, right now, so they used to have a lot of uh, Springfield Model 1903s, the, the rifles. Um, they've kind of worked their way through those. They have the, the, uh, the M1A1 or the M1 Grands um, that they go through. And you're right. So some of these, some of these rifles are what you would consider very poor condition, and you don't get to you don't get to go buy that rifle unless you go to Camp Perry, Ohio, and there's a place in Alabama where they have a storefront, and you can go in there. What you typically would do is you would order one, and what they do is they send you the next one in the box. So it can come packed in petroleum jelly, and you will spend the next month cleaning this thing. Uh, it can come with a wore-out barrel because it's been shot through five, 6,000 times. Right, match grade barrel less than a thousand times. You want to replace it. These things can have six, ten thousand round shot through them. They're just horrible. So yeah, I've heard once again, not an NRA thing. I've heard that some of the older uh, 1903s, the Garands, those um, don't clean too much because they just like running dirty. Oh, you have a Mosler? Oh, Mosin Nagan. Okay. I thought you said Mosler. I was like, I've only heard of one person owning one of those. All right. Um, Mosin Nagan. I, I would love to shoot one of those. All right. Um, so that's actually, that's actually it. What I'll do is for the West Virginia folks, or the, I guess I should say the non-North Carolina folks, sorry, <laughs> again, um, is uh, if you took this class because... Uh, you wanted to satisfy the requirements for your uh, concealed handgun license, I will need your name as it appears on your ID. And what I'll do is I will write up. Is ever, Are all of you guys going to be available tomorrow? Yeah. I, I can just give all yours to him. Okay. Yeah, so what I can do is I can print up these forms tomorrow, and uh, I'll have them here. I'll give you your group, sure. your whole family, your troop. Um, uh and then uh, we'll have at least one notary, maybe yeah. two. Uh, and yeah, then can you can just take, this will be your official, if you don't pay for the course, you don't get a certificate. But what it can do is that, I keep wanting to call it an attestation, that's not what it is. Yeah, affidavit, um, which is a actual legal document that says you took this course and, and you passed. All right. Well, all right, thanks a lot.